In 1836, nearly 50 years after all 13 new American states sent delegates to the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, James Madison's careful notes of that convention were published. At the time of their publication, neither he nor any other convention delegate still lived. Madison's notes of debates in the Federal Convention of 1787 presented to the nation a first-hand account of ideas tested and probed, of voting coalitions form, rise, and fall, of petty politicking as well as statesmanship on a grand scale. Madison's notes present to the nation a portrait of a democratic founding as our constitutional republic took shape. As Israel nears its 70th birthday, historian Martin Kramer invites us into the Yishuv's proto-parliament, into the petty politicking and grand statesmanship of the founding of the Jewish state. Welcome to the Tikva podcast and great Jewish essays and ideas. I'm your host, Jonathan Silver. This week, we join Martin Kramer as he tries to reconstruct, in particular, the famous vote taken by the proto-cabinet to declare Israel's independence in the first place. This is the vote you can find in virtually every history of the period, a dramatic moment when David Ben-Gurion almost single-handedly inspired and emboldened the other committee members who, despite their own serious reservations, were persuaded to join him in declaring Israel's independence. There's just one problem. Reviewing the original documents and surveying all the evidence, Kramer comes to discover that the most famous vote of all actually didn't happen. Kramer makes his case in his essay, The May 1948 Vote That Made the State of Israel, published in April 2018 in Mosaic Magazine, and he makes his case here on the Tikva podcast. He also helps us see what votes of real consequence actually were cast in those decisive meetings of Israel's proto-cabinet just a short time before the British mandate came to an end. If you enjoyed listening to our podcast, you can subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher, where you can leave us a rating and a review. And if you want to learn more about our work at Tikva, you can visit our website, tikvafund.org, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And now, my conversation with the chair of the Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies Department at Shalem College, of which he was also the inaugural president, and author of many essays and books, including most recently, The War on Error, Martin Kramer. Martin Kramer, welcome to the Take Food Podcast. Pleasure to be here. So part of the work of the essay is to undo a conventional story about a dramatic moment in Israel's founding. Why don't we just begin with the convention? What happened in the lead up to the declaration of the state of Israel? Well, there had been long been a story um, which had some significant authorities behind it, which claimed that uh, the decision to declare the state uh, hung in the balance just a couple of days before it was declared, that there were leaders who were riddled with doubts about whether it was wise to declare independence or perhaps preferable to accept an American proposal for a truce or a ceasefire. At this point, it was a three-month ceasefire, which the Americans were pushing very hard on um, Israel's representative, de facto, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Moshe Shertog. Um, why did this thesis gain credence? Because in the lead up to Britain's evacuation, the end of the mandate, Arab states, neighboring Israel, had made it quite clear that they would invade. Now, a war had already been wage, uh, raging in Palestine itself, as between Jews and Arabs, Jews and Palestinian Arabs, in which, generally speaking, the Jews had the upper hand. But there was a lot of concern that once the Arab armies invaded, the situation would be very different. These were armies, for instance, the Egyptian army had a navy and an air force, neither of which the Yishuv had. Transjordan had a British commanded legion, uh, which was considered to be the most effective Arab fighting force anywhere. So, so the, the scale of conflict was about to change. It was about to change. It would be a general war. With conventional forces With from, con the, from the Arab states as opposed to what were essentially militia groups. Right. I mean, the Haganah and the Palmach were militia groups. Uh, there was some concern, and military leaders expressed that concern quite openly uh, to uh, Ben Goyan and to, to others. Um, although they said that if we given enough time to organize and to mobilize, that we would have uh, a good chance. Um, it ranged from good to 50-50, depending on who was giving the analysis. So according to this uh, conventional story, the People's Administration, which was a kind of proto-cabinet, assembled on May 12th for a very long vote, uh, session in which there were several votes. One of the votes is said to have been 
a narrow six to four vote to declare independence, or rather to reject the truce proposal, which in all, to all intents and purposes would mean declaring independence. And the hero of this vote is David Ben-Gurion. Uh, according to differing accounts, <clears throat> as nearly all of the other members walked into the room predisposed to accept uh, the truce and to delay the um, declaration of independence. And Ben-Gurion turned, uh, turned them all around by the, the, the sheer potency of his argument. And the vote ended as a six to four vote rejecting the truce and therefore steering Israel towards independence, Declaration of Independence, two days later. It's a great story. Um, it's dramatic. It has an almost biblical quality to it. It paints Ben-Gurion as a real founder statesman hero. Well, it may, of course, Ben-Gurion comes across as the hero. And I say it's, 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 it's almost cast him in a Moses-like role because you, here you have the others saying, well, the desert, the, the, the sea is deep, the desert is wide, the land is inhabited by giants. We're all fearful, and he sort of bucks everyone up. And so this version was um, <clears throat> retailed by the cabinet secretary who put it in a book that he wrote about um, those few days in May 1948. And it was repeated by most historians, one might even say copied by most historians, one from the other. And then in 1978, the minutes of the meeting were published, and there's no vote. It's not there. And these are very extensive minutes. They don't record everything said, but they certainly record another vote, which was taken. So why isn't this vote there? Well, there are two possibilities. One is that there was some kind of conspiracy afoot to strike the vote from the minutes. The other is it didn't happen. And my inclination is to believe, along with several other historians who've come to the same conclusion, that it didn't happen. Well, let's get to your argument, the, the historical evidence that you bring to justify that that view in a minute. But let's just try to understand what turns on whether the vote happened or not. Why is this consequential? Because um, the, the implied conclusion of um, the argument that there had to have been a vote was that if there hadn't been a vote, maybe the state of Israel wouldn't have come into being. The Americans talked about a ceasefire. They'd earlier talked about a truce. But the those who advocated speedy declaration of independence said that this was really a, a ruse. At the end of the day, under the uh, guise of a truce, a trusteeship would be imposed, a UN trusteeship. It would be a continuation of the mandate, and it would um, essentially cancel out the partition plan. Um, no one could implement the partition plan. It looked like it would bring only war and destruction. Many of the outside powers were beginning to have doubts. Well, let's just continue the mandate. Let's consider some kind of trusteeship, something to keep the two parties from going at each other. And could have conceivably been not just a temporary three-month delay, but an indefinite delay. So that adds to sort of the fatefulness of the meeting. So for now the, or never was the was the phrase that was used. There's even a book in Hebrew called "Now and Never" about this um, the sequence of events. The notion being that if we don't do it now, there simply will not be a state. And the window was opening; it was about to close, so we had to jump through it now. Uh, but all doing so with trepidation, led by David Ben Gurion. So this is this is why the the vote looms as such a um, such a crucial one in historiography. It's very hard, I think, for people who follow Israeli history who are excited by that moment, looking back, to put themselves at that table of decision during which this thirteen hour marathon deliberation took place, and weigh dispassionately what the arguments for declaring a state. But on the other hand, there were serious arguments against it. And I think part of the part of this essay actually brings some of those arguments back to life. You report that it was M Moshe Shertak himself coming back from a meeting with Marshall in Washington, in which now historians may have may have misinterpreted this or emphasized his lack of resolve, whereas the the evidence that you bring was that he never really lacked resolve all that much. On the other hand, Marshall had serious warnings that were in fact uh, repeated by military analysis within Israel itself. Let's just try to re-inhabit that moment and understand what the cause for argument would have been. What's, what's the case against declaring a state? Well, the case against declaring the state <clears throat> was, um, based, as I said earlier, on doubts about whether the issue would be able to withstand the invasion of the Arab armies. And um, there was also, I think, some concern about defying the United States, although Asher took made clear in his I mean, with Marsh, the United States hadn't done anything so far for the Yishuv. The Yishuv had fought the war up to that point on its own. And if anything, uh, enjoyed more support from the Soviet Union than 
in the United States. Um, but I think that was the main concern, that, this, this, that here, just a few years after the Holocaust, the whole thing could end in a conflagration so, involving 600,000 Jews who would be now at the mercy of invading Arab armies. So the most charitable way to put it, I mean, I, I don't know if you agree with this proposition or this formulation, the most charitable way to put it is, of course, all of us want to see Jewish continuity, Jewish survival, Jewish prosperity, if we can. But we, we can't. Right now, if we were to declare a state, we would be inviting a second Holocaust, you know, just a few short, short years after the conclusion of the first and risk alienating the great, the great power that might, you know, one day serve as our supporter to boot. Yes, that, that would have been that would have been the argument. So why such resolve in the face of that? Well, because um, the Zionist movement and the Yishuv have been preparing for this moment from the very inception, and uh, had steeled itself for this moment. They were not trembling Israelites. They had rejoiced at the partition resolution, filled the streets. And in the press and in the public, there had built, been built over the previous months a, um, a steady resolve to move forward. And there had been victories, military victories against the Palestinian Arabs. Jaffa had just recently been taken, and the Palestinians had fled Jaffa en masse. And there were other gains too. And so one goes back and rereads the minutes in that light, one sees that basically there was no decision at that point to be made. Some allude to that quite openly. Shertok himself told Marshall, we can't stop the momentum. I want to just read that, that quote that you bring from Shertok. It's, an, it's actually an amazing thing for um, a member of a not yet fully formed and consecrated government, a member of the proto-government to write the following to the Secretary of State in the United States. It wasn't written. It was something that he said he said to Marshall. Ah, report, right. Reported after the right. fact. But in any event, um, Shertok, you know, later a president of Israel, would, would come to say to, to Secretary Marshall, we stand on the threshold of fulfilling the hope of centuries, the culmination of an enterprise in which generations have sunk their efforts. This is within our grasp for us to agree to any delay without any certainty that the state would arise after the delay would oblige us to stand in judgment before human history, which we cannot do under any circumstances. The process of territorial and functional taking over was in full swing. Any leadership that tries to break this momentum would be swept from the stage. Now, in, a, in other words, to say the political decision is a fait accompli. Right. And so the hero of May 12, 1948 isn't David Ben-Goyer. The hero is the people. The hero is the Yishuv. All the efforts which David Ben-Goyer and others had put into repairing the Yishuv for this day that came to be expressed at that moment. And um, Shertok, by the way, said this not long after the fact. This was what he said to the, people, the People's Administration. This is what he said that he told Marshall. And others present said we really had no alternative. The trigger had been pulled. In fact, the trigger had formally been pulled a month earlier by the Zionist Executive Council, which had basically created the People's Administration with the express purpose of creating a provisional government on May 15, 1948. A point that Ben-Gurion reminded the members of the People Administration of in that, in that uh, discussion that they had. The decision had been made already. They were there to implement the decision, not to take the decision. Um, and so it really is, a, it, in many ways, a stirring moment. You see that this community of Jews is different from all other communities of Jews. Despite the Holocaust, Holocaust despite the doubts, despite the, the somehow, the 50-50 the, 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 the chance given by Yigal Yadin to... Ben Gurion, which wasn't known to the wider public, but which he shared with the People's Administration, there was still this very strong sense that the Jews were ready. Different from different from other Jews, different from the Israelites of old, because this Zionist Yishuv felt themselves under the judgment of Zionist history, of Jewish history, and was prepared to sacrifice everything to make this long-held dream real. And they felt themselves already to be a state. This is something actually that Ben Gurion had said on other occasions. He said the state essentially exists, whether we declare it or not. The institutions of the state, the military prowess of the of the issue, all this had been built up with an aim to creating a state. And the state, and that's the amazing thing about Israel when it comes into being. We talk about state building. The state building had been built before the state had been built before the state was declared. Uh, and so, basically, on May twelfth, uh, the triggers pulled, but everything was loaded and ready to go. So, um, yes, the minutes, if you read them, express the nagging doubts of some of the participants. But this minion around the table, these 10 people really weren't called upon to make a decision. The decision had been made for them and they essentially um, ratified it and then went on to more important business. Why wasn't Benachem Begin at the meeting and do you think his absence played any role there? Well, the Irgun was not part of the institutions of the Yishuv. It was an underground. 
So when the Zionist executive created the, uh, the People's Administration, revisionists were not included. The underground would only come out from underground after the declaration of the state. Now, Menachem Begin made it quite clear that if a state were declared on May 15th or May 14th, that he would accept its authority and um, pledge loyalty to it. But if the state were not declared, if there was hesitation, then he would declare the state. Um, as he put it, he said, the Hebrew state will come into being uh, come what may on that date. And the members of the People's Administration knew that if they didn't declare the state, someone else would. And that this could bring about internal dissension. It's even mentioned explicitly by a couple of members in the course of deliberations without naming Menachem Begin. But everyone knew that, um, that the Irgun had such a plan because it had been publicized. Proclamation had been issued by the Irgun to that effect. Now, um, there are some who argue, and I don't go into this in the article, that in fact Ben-Gurion had a secret channel to Menachem Begin and was perfectly happy for Menachem Begin to make these, well, you can call them threats, because it served his purpose in, in uh, eliminating any possible opposition to the declaration of the state. It's a contentious issue there, but there's certainly no, no question that around the table, everyone knew that Menachem Begin and the Yogur were waiting. And that um, if they didn't want to contest the leadership of the, the, the state that would come into being with him, or, or to miss the, um, they miss the boat with the sentiment of, of the people, that they had to act. No, and it's you know there's a, there are interesting moments in the history of Israel in this phase where people do things urgently because they think someone else will do it before them. A good example, of course, is the uh, American de facto recognition of Israel. If you go into the considerations that were there, of course, there were many different ones. But one of the, the key the key one there was the the apprehension that the Soviet Union would do it first. Um, this is actually something that. Um, Harry Truman later made explicit in a letter to Eleanor Roosevelt. The Russians were about to do it. She was, she, she was a bit upset that the U.S.-U.N. delegation had been left in the lurch, didn't know that this was going to happen as quickly as it did. So this is another instance um, where I think um, urgency was added to the fact that there was someone else prepared to do exactly the same thing if they didn't. 119 pages of minutes emerged from this marathon meeting on May 12th. And the vote to declare independence and to reject the truce proposal is not, does not appear. But there is a consequential vote that does appear. What's that? The question wasn't whether to declare a state or not to declare a state. The question was what sort of state to declare. And in particular, what relationship should that state have to the UN Partition Resolution of November? Um, the Partition Resolution had been celebrated as one which gave it a license to the creation of the Jewish state. And it came with a map, and the map was not entirely to the liking of the Zionist leadership. The biggest problem in the map was Jerusalem. Jerusalem had um, was to have been an international zone, um, surrounded entirely on all sides by the projected Arab state. There were 100,000 Jews there, about a sixth of the population of the Yeshua. And there were other problems on the map, um, which left uh, Jewish settlements in the Arab state. Nevertheless, from November 1947 onward, the Zionist movement, the Jewish agency, had been steadfast in accepting the partition plan in its totality. And that tendency actually continued right through the early months of 1948 as the United States and others retreated from the partition plan. So accepting the partition plan in its totality means accepting the projected borders. Of right, the, plan. the projected borders. So this was the, the, the crucial question, whether to accept um, whether to mention, of course, the partition plan was going to be mentioned in the Declaration of Independence. The question was, though, whether to say that the state was being created in the framework of the partition plan. And a frame, as you know, is a border. Only what is in the frame is in the frame, and what is outside of the frame is outside the frame. Or on the basis, but many different things on a base. And whether to mention the borders explicitly in the uh, declaration. Now, there were a number of members of the People's Administration with legal expertise, one who would later become Minister of Justice and another who would become Minister of Police, who both said that um, the declaration had to mention borders. <clears throat> it had to declare the state in the framework of the partition plan within the partition borders. This would also get, 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 give Israel the chance to win the most international recognition. And the early drafts in fact, all of the early drafts of the Declaration of Independence explicitly say that 
the state will be is being is to be is declared within the borders of the November 1947 partition plan. Which means excluding Jerusalem. Excluding yeah. Jerusalem, excluding most of the Galilee, excluding um, part of the Negev, as you, as, and Jaffa, which was to be an Arab enclave. Many would have argued that it would have been untenable as a Jewish state uh, with uh, no hold in Jerusalem at all. So Ben Gurion looked at this draft, which was presented by a formidable jurist, and said, "There's no reason we should mention. We have to mention the borders in the Declaration of Independence." He brought the American Declaration of Independence as an example. There's no mention of territory there. Yes, it's true. He said a sovereign state should. It's made up of population and territory and borders. This is a declaration which which doesn't require it. And he said, I've studied, I studied in the law books as well. Um, he had briefly prepared himself to be a, a lawyer in the legal studies in Istanbul, which cut short in 1914. So he never completed his studies. Here he was up against these jurists and legal experts. One was a famous jurist, the other had been a judge in the period of the British mandate. And then he said more than that. He said, if we, he gave two examples. If we take the Western Galilee, where there had been some, some besieged Jewish settlements, and which was allotted to the Arab state, or a corridor to Jerusalem, which had also been allotted to the Arab state, these will become part of the state if we have the force to hold them. So it wasn't just an abstract question. It was a very real question. And a debate uh, ensued over this. And in the end, Ben-Gurion said, we will on this we'll take a vote. Now, had, had the same kind of diplomatic outreach been done on this question as had been done on the declar declaring a state in the first place? Meaning, had, had Ben-Gurion and his emissaries consulted with the Americans and with, um, with the Russians and with regional powers about this question? No, because the question was considered to be uh, fixed and solved. The Jewish agency's consistent position in representing Israel's stand to other nations was that Israel would declare a state in the partition borders. And in fact, if you look at um, <clears throat> the, um, the letter sent by Israel's, well, the Jewish agency's representative in Washington to Truman asking for recognition, he says the state has been declared in the borders of the partition plan. It's not true. The state wasn't declared in any borders. So that had been the consistent. There was no discussion, and it was just assumed. And when queries were made, and in Washington, a couple of both Clark Clifford and Roy Henderson, who were both in the White House and the State Department, involved in Truman's decision, actually asked and emphasized that this should be the case. They received reassurances. But Ben-Gurion had changed the Yeshua's position at the last moment. He changed the draft of the declaration at the last moment. Now, when he put it forward to the People's Council, which was the proto-Knesset, which met earlier on the day of the declaration, he said, we have, we have sidestepped the question. You see, we, didn't, we don't say that no to UN borders, but we don't say the opposite. So let's, let's, let's unpack that. Both why, yeah. why, why the decision, Ben-Gurion having fixed in his own mind, the wisdom of being vague about this point. Why the decision to bring it up for a vote in the first place? And second of all, how to present it rhetorically? Okay, two issues. Um, why bring up the vote in the first place? Because Ben-Gurion found himself arrayed against two jurists who were saying, well, we must have this. This is what international law requires. So how could he overcome that? Later, he would say he would take particular pride in having made this bold stroke because he said, I, I was thrown out of law school. <laughs> Who am I to go up against these two major authorities? So he mustered uh, the, um, uh, the majority in that instance, and it was an error one, as you can see. I mean, there were still, there were real concerns here. And this is the difference between this vote and the vote that didn't happen. There was huge momentum towards independence, but the momentum on the matter of borders was in the other direction. The momentum there of established policy, of public rhetoric, and so forth and so on, had been to accept partition borders. So here, Ben Gurion was going against the momentum. He wasn't riding some wave. And what he does is basically he, he, he overrules the experts by popular uh, consent. And I think that's why he felt that he needed a vote on this point. He couldn't simply do, say, well, you know, we have an agreement here and, and strike this, uh, or I, 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 my, my opinion is superior to yours, and then strike this important line from the declaration. Uh, and so that's why there was a vote on this point. Now, he understood that it was a narrow vote. So he went to present it to the People's uh, Council after the People's Administration had voted. Right, now not the proto-government, but the proto-Knesset. Proto-Knesset. When he goes there, 
he presents this in a um, what's it, a master stroke of wording. He says, "I," he says, "We we shouldn't commit ourselves. We don't know what will happen." He said, "But we sidestep the question." Now, what did they say? They didn't sidestep the question of what would go into the declaration or not. I mean, that was unequivocal. But what he did was he created ambiguity where there had been certainty. Before May 12, 1948, the state in waiting was committed to the partition borders. On May 12, 1948, and afterwards, there was a, <clears throat> Ben Gurion presented as a consensus that um, Israel would not be committed to this map and that the fortunes of war would decide Israel's future borders. And this was a, a really crucial you know, decision which would have implications both for Israel in 1948 49 and up to the present day. So often people, when they talk about Israel's Declaration of Independence, look and see what's not there and then debate it. So God is not mentioned. There's some of the Tzul Yisrael, Rock of Israel, is there. Nobody would deny today that religion plays an important role in Israel and in the state. Democracy was in an early draft and it was also taken out. It's another discussion about why it was taken out, but nobody would argue today that Israel isn't a democracy. But the borders were, the mention of the borders was taken out. And to this day, Israel doesn't have borders. So that's the omission which has, in many ways, the most lasting effect. The other two, the omission is inconsequential in the long term. But here, the omission was very consequential because at the end of the war, Israel does effectively annex the territories that is taken in war. Blood was shed in a war against, and, and, and losses were taken in a war against aggressors. And it was Ben Gurion's idea, notion that if others wage war against you, uh, the map is reopened for redrawing. And um, as a consequence of 1948, Israel grows by almost 50% over the partition plan, from 55% of the territory of the mandate to 78%. That so called green line included what were Israel's first occupied territories, if you will, which were beyond the um, partition lines. And actually, Israel had to make a special act specifying internally that Israeli law was to prevail in the territories taken beyond the partition line, as it was a question. And I think that, um, that had Ben-Gurion not done what he did, Israel would have been imprisoned in the partition borders. Even if the fortunes of war had changed the map, Israel would be imprisoned because it would always serve as a reference. The, the partition map would always right. serve as a reference point, which would assume the most, the most consensus in international opinion. Because Israel had accepted it itself. And one of the great achievements of the period between 1949 and 1957 was to get the international community to understand and to accept the armistice lines as de facto borders of Israel. Um, Makes me wonder if there's any... Any other moments that Ben Gurion might have thought more imaginatively, might pr more prospectively, where other votes might have been taken, other agenda items, or that emerge from this 119-page set of minutes about what else Ben Gurion thought my, Israel might do in terms of securing its territory and and creating you know more secure borders for itself. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I do know this: that um, here we have a meeting which in which supposedly. The participants were wondering whether Israel would be destroyed, considering what Israel should do with additional territorial conquests beyond what had been allotted in the partition plan. I mean, this is two, these are two totally different moods, atmospheres. So yes, you know, doubts are expressed. What are our chances? Military experts say here and there, we have this weakness, that weakness. Even Ben Gorin pointed out the weaknesses as far as equipment and um, mobilization and manpower and so forth. And yet by the end of the meeting, what are they discussing? Conquests, which they anticipate beyond the partition plan and what the relationship of those conquests should be to the state that's about to be declared. I mean, this is a totally different story. Um, and it's the one which is supported by, by the vote. And it also shows that from the very beginning, and this is the other crucial significance of it, there was, first of all, division over the territorial extent of the state. It's a division that continues to this day. But that the process uh, for debating these divisions was going to be a democratic one. Um, Israel's democracy from the, its very birth, these decisions are decided by votes of representatives. Uh, Ben-Gurion won this one, he will lose later ones. So when you tell this story, you see a very a much more self-confident Israel, which is already debating what is being debated in Israel today, when Israel is a regional power. What do we do with territory that we hold that um, for one reason or another was not included in our original mandate uh, for um, territorial expense. And in this case, um, Ben-Gurion sets a precedent 
for Israel. And the precedent is this. If you are attacked, if you, there's aggression against you, then in such a war, you can annex territory which you have taken in self-defense. <laughs> What has made America so welcoming to its Jewish citizens, and what has the Jewish tradition contributed to the ideas that make America exceptional? The Tikva Fund invites you to join Rabbi Dr. Mayer Soloveitchik for eight hour-long lectures to think together with us about Jewish ideas and the American founders. We'll learn about the Talmud and Thomas Paine, explore the connection between the Ketubah and the Constitution, and meet the Shabbat-observant Jewish friend of the Founders, who is at the center of America's first religious freedom court case. To accompany Rabbi Soloveitchik in this study of Jewish ideas in the American Founders, visit courses.tikvafund.org for more information and to enroll. You begin the essay by contrasting the 1968 Ben-Gurion to the 1948 Ben-Gurion. Mm-hmm. So just for for viewer for listeners who haven't read yet read the piece, what does 1968 Ben-Gurion say and why did he say that given what you've just told us about the 1948 Ben-Gurion? Uh, 1968 Ben-Gurion said on some – well, Ben-Gurion said many things after 1967, some of them contradictory. But there was um, – there were some interviews which he gave, one of which appears notably in a film called Ben-Gurion Epilogue, which won, got a lot of attention both in Israel and uh, in, in this country said that he would be prepared if he had the choice between the territory and peace to prefer peace. He made an exception for Jerusalem and the Golan Heights. I've seen other places where he made an exception for Hebron. And this has been used, uh, this quote has been used again and again um, to persuade the public that Ben-Gurion was in favor of territorial concessions. Now, Ben-Gurion by 1968 was not the Ben-Gurion of 1948 on all kinds of levels. He became a kind of a prophet, speaking in a prophetic register. But it would be a mistake to confuse Ben Gurion of '68 with Ben Gurion of '48, and I would argue that what Ben Gurion had to say in '68 already wasn't relevant, really. Not so much what Ben Gurion said, but what Ben Gurion did, which is significant. Now, Ben Gurion also, if and here I bring us to a, perhaps another vote, Ben Gurion also, on one occasion in 1948, was restrained from taking additional territory. In 1948, Israel could have wound up in occupation of most of the West Bank. Ben Gurion proposed it in September 1948. By then, the issue was in a vastly different position. It had not 25,000 men under arms, but 80,000 men under arms. It had already won a series of victories against Arab armies. There were generals who were saying, "Why don't we settle for lines, the lines that we have now? We can expand into the West Bank. We can take Latrun, which had been kind of a, a bone in the throat of." Of, um, uh, of the issue of, 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 the, of the IDF, we had lost a number of battles. We can take that, open completely the way to Jerusalem, take Jerusalem, take Hebron, push up into the West Bank hills. And Ben Gurion went in September 1948 and put a, precisely that proposal to the cabinet. I want to just underscore this for a moment. Yeah. So Ben Gurion is on record in favor of, in 1948, taking Jerusalem? Yes. And it was his proposal. And he said, if we do this, we can move, we can move ourselves up to the mountain range. We can come down through the Jezreel Valley. He envisioned Samaria in this proposal as a kind of Gaza. And now, what would happen to the Arabs in those places? He thought they would do what the Arabs and elsewhere had done up until that point, which was mostly to flee. From some places they were driven out, but even Benny Morris says for the most part, they fled. And that's what he wrote in his diary when he proposed that to anyone who would say, well, what will we do with all these Arabs? He said, well, they'll do what they did in Lid and Ramla and Jaffa and so forth. They would leave, including from Jerusalem. Now, if you read the minutes of that meeting, you see there was a lot of pushback because it was feared by many members of the government. By now, we're talking about the provisional government of Israel, that um, this would lead to a general conflagration. The war would start anew on all fronts. Israel would not have international legitimacy. Count Bernadotte had been murdered by the um, just 10 days before. So there was a lot of pressure on Israel to f- bring the murderers to account and so forth and so on. And Ben-Gurion was outvoted. Seven to six, and later he would call this um, this vote a bichial It was the, the, the lament unto generations. In other words, we had an opportunity to act here, and we did. There's a debate about that vote. We see some people say, "Well, if Ben Gurion really wanted to carry that vote, he would have done all the legwork ahead of time. He would have made sure that it carried. Maybe he had his own doubts, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. But I'm I'm not so sure that we can. Um, and we can draw that conclusion. I think Ben-Gurion ran up against real opposition here. This was not, 
the situation that we faced in getting the state declared, where there was no real opposition. Here there was serious opposition and it was forcefully expressed if you read the minutes. So he actually called the failure to take a huge chunk of the West Bank a mistake. And he did so right into the 50s. One of the reasons he did so also was um, because there were a number of generals, he got alone the most, most prominently, who said the war ended badly. The green line is indefensible. We have penetrations coming through. There, there's foreign armies have bases west of the Jordan. We should have gone when we had the opportunity and taken more. Ben Gurion in 1949, he did an, the armistice agreement with the Trans Jordan. He gave a speech in the Knesset. And there he said, Yes, we could have taken more, but if we had taken, if we, in order to take more, we would have had to use the methods of Dir Yassin, in other words, what Begin and his crowd had done. And this we could not do, and if we'd acted then, we would have had an Arab majority in the country. But that's not what he thought in 1948. 1948, he thought that the Arabs would flee not on the basis of some kind of Dir Yassin operation, but on the basis of what they'd done previously, which was just to see the war coming and to leave. So he had, on the one hand, he had to justify the armistice agreements, but then he would blame Sharet, Shertok, and others who voted against him for saddling Israel with this, um, these undefensible borders. And Ben Gurion's position on this very much created the atmosphere in 1967 that here, the historic opportunity had come. Ben-Gurion's principle here is that when aggressed upon, Israel can, ter- can win territorial expansion and that territorial expansion legitimately be considered part of Israel. Yes, That's Ben-Gurion's you, principle. No, it, he, was, yeah. he was restrained from executing that principle in, 40, in 48, but in 67, the architects of the Six-Day War saw themselves as executing this earlier principle that Ben-Gurion had himself articulated even though the 68 Ben-Gurion had come to right. dismiss it. Right, exactly, exactly. And Ben-Gurion was very excited in 67. He went up to Jerusalem. He ordered, um, he, he was the first to point it to the, um, to the Arab quarter, which was adjacent to the Western Wall and said, this must be demolished. Um, he went off to Hebron to view it and later wrote an article called Hebron, Sister of Jerusalem, which he argued that Hebron was as important as Jerusalem to the Jewish people and should be settled. So there's, there are contradictory things in, in Ben Gurion's way he expressed himself in '68. He had, like many labor leaders, willingness to give up some territory, but everybody oh, they all disagreed about which territory to return. So, but he also, even then, he conditioned this idea of returning territory. Um, he said, "We return territory in return for peace." But the way, but time and again, if you listen to the other shoe drop, it was that the Arabs are not ready for peace. Um, We have no one to talk to. There's no partner. Um, Exactly the kinds of things which had been said in the lead up to 1948. So he was very, and this is something that, you know, Labor always, the Labor Party later was always systematic in doing, saying we're open to peace. But between 67 and 77, when they could have made some kind of territorial compromise, they couldn't agree on what to give back and what to keep. No one wanted to give it all back. So I think, you know, the Ben-Gurion legacy overall and the, the labor legacy overall is one of um, of looking at opportunities presented by aggressive wars to improve the geostrategic position of the state and make it more viable and survivable in the longer term. Now, how would you say that that larger dimension of, you could say a larger principle of Ben-Gurion statecraft to take advantage of, of opportunities when aggressed upon relates to another pillar of Ben-Gurion statecraft, which is the constant need to cultivate great, great power support? Mm. Well, it wasn't been, just Ben Gurion's principle. It goes back to Chaim Weizmann and Theodore Herzl. All of them were looking for external uh, support. But Ben Gurion also understood, and this was probably the more important aspect of his legacy, because as I said, even Chaim Weizmann and Herzl talked about the support of outside powers. But there's really no substitute for one's own, one's own strength. And that, in fact, one gets more respect from great powers when one shows oneself capable of defending oneself. Uh, the great powers were not being called upon to wage Israel's wars. Um, the great powers were not being called upon to defend Israel, deploy troops, guarantee its borders. This would be done by the Jews themselves. And that was really Ben Gurion's guiding principle. Um, he would often say that the UN, that the Israel owed nothing to the UN partition plan. It was never implemented. No one ever sent forces. The Americans didn't help, certainly. If anyone helped, it was the Soviets. But that basically Israel was created by 
the IDF. Its borders were defined by the IDF. It was an act of will by the Jewish people. So yes, he did cultivate great power support. It was at a point where he understood quite well that Britain was a declining empire and that more emphasis should be placed on relations with the United States. But um, he did not want to become dependent. The message of David Ben-Gurion was that Israel must be independent, it cannot become the client, the proxy, the dependency of, of any great power. And in order to achieve that, what it has to use is its relationship with great powers in order to build its own power. And that's been, I think, the consistent hallmark of Israeli policy. Remember, when he formulated that, it was in the wake of the Holocaust. Where, had been, where, where were the, the friends of the Jews during the Holocaust? If there's anything that underlies the sort of Zionist worldview when it comes to security, it's that at the end of the day, you cannot rely on anyone to protect you. You have to protect yourself. That in various changing circumstances, even the best of your friends can abandon you. Those who issued the Balfour Declaration abandoned the Jews with the White Paper of 1939. America, which had supported partition, backed away from partition months later. Um, these are shifting winds. So the great, you know, the, in, the keen insight of David Ben-Gurion was we have to build our independent power. Let me turn to another aspect of the essay, which is not part of the argument of the essay, but came to mind when I first read it. This is not the first time that Martin Kramer, historian, has tried to question orthodoxies and conventions in, in the field. And in fact, most of our listeners will associate you, if not with Shalem's college, then with the polemics that you've, that you've levied against colleagues in Middle Eastern studies. Part of the polemics that you've levied against colleagues in Middle Eastern studies have to do with their, as you say, as you say your, their abandonment of the kind of dispassionate historical analysis that had been, in some sense, for all their faults, the hallmark of the Orientalist manner of studying the, studying the Middle East that preceded the current generation of Middle Eastern studies academics. And that the current, middle, current generation of Middle Eastern studies academics in abandoning that dispassionate stance has adopted a more polemical, more politicized, more ideologically orthodox approach to study of, to the study of the Middle East. In The War on Error, a book of essays that you recently published, you revisit some of the earlier debates from, debates from the 90s in which you fir first articulated this big critique. But this is an essay, this mosaic essay is an essay of love, I mean, written by someone, who, a historian who himself is a Zionist. And I wonder in your work how you balance Zionist affinities and loyalties with a the dispassionate search for truth that defines the role of a historian. Well, it's an excellent question, and the answer is a complex one. I don't see myself as a Zionist historian. I see myself as a, as a Zionist and a historian. These are two different things. Just as someone can be a Zionist and an economist. Is there such a thing as Zionist economics? History, if it is to be anything like economics... Um, is a discipline, and a discipline is meant to filter out bias. Um, now, the pursuit of history is ultimately the pursuit of truth. And um, so I think there's really just one stand. All forms of um, nationalist history are a form of filtering, and I think are problematic. And I did a lot of work on the way in which Arab nationalist history uh, created a situation in which the Arabs never came to terms with their own past. Um, so we certainly wouldn't want that in the case of, of the Jews or Zionists. Now, my mentor, Bernard Lewis, used to say it was perfectly legitimate to let your commitments decide the questions that you ask, the directions of your research, the kinds of things that uh, excite your curiosity, problems that you want to solve, but not for your commitments to dictate your conclusions. Uh, there you had to practice a kind of uh, objectivity as best as one can. You know, Postmodernists came along and said, there's no such thing as objectivity. It's all, you know, we're all telling narrative stories. We all have our biases. Let's give them free reign. Because if there's no objectivity, then why pretend? And so you only wound up with advocacy scholarship and advocacy teaching, uh, all of which was predicated on the notion that you didn't have to tell the other side of the story. You didn't have to deal with conflicting evidence. Uh, you built a narrative which served your purpose. Lewis used to quote a well-known economist who would say, who said, it's, we cannot achieve complete asepsis in the operating room, total sterility, but it doesn't mean we operate in a sewer. Uh, we do the best we can. And so what the historian does is try to take into account and to um, 
and to negate his biases. Now, I was prompted to do this article and many other articles because of my commitment. I am, of course, committed to Israel. I became an Israeli by choice. I, I see my contribution in some small way as enlightening us about our own history so that we learn from it and be strengthened through that process. But I can't let that dictate my conclusions. And so, yes, it's a labor of love, but um, others could read it in contradictory ways. Someone else could read this article and say, well, Martin Kramer has told this interesting story about the resolve of the yeshuv, the unanimity of or the fortitude of the yeshuv as a whole as it goes forth. Someone else would come along and read it and maybe say, well, this proves that Ben Gurion had a master plan for expelling the Palestinians and taking territory even from the very moment of the birth of the state. That's a reading. That's another reading that someone could make of this. Um, I don't think it'd be a correct reading, but I certainly wouldn't suppress the evidence of what Ben Gurion had to say or to, or to diminish its significance. I, th I happen to think that what he did on that day was important and to the future of Israel and added substantially to the viability of Israel going forward. Others would say that it was tantamount to planning a um, um, aggression against the Palestinians and their displacement. They might suppress other evidence. I haven't suppressed the evidence. I brought forward the evidence because I find it compelling. Now, a lot of things happen and are told in history because they add dramatic effect. And um, I think it's, you know, it's the, a key element in the discipline of history is to look for those instances and see whether you cannot tell Get back to the sort of the, the, the core story, the original story, the original truth of events, stripping away elements which have been added or embellished simply for dramatic purpose, which isn't to say that the story is, doesn't remain inspirational. So in this case, there was no vote, right? But there was still plenty of drama, if you will. And you can find inspiration. And as you show, other yeah. votes. And other votes, which inspire. And as I showed in another article, there was no massacre in Lida which was sort of created um, by an author in order to enhance the sort of narrative effect of his storytelling. Um, but there's no question that, you know, the conquest of Lydda and Rama are absolutely part of this story too, are absolutely crucial in the definition of the state's borders and its future viability. So these are, so you know, as I say, I, the questions that I ask are prompted by my commitments, but I try not to simply write history as it might appear on the Ministry of Foreign Affairs website. On a previous uh, episode of the Tikva podcast, we were joined by your former colleague, Daniel Polliser, to discuss Ernst Renan's essay about the, the meaning of a nation, in which one of the con most consequential preconditions for a nation to arise is a kind of shared memory, which is held together by the people who live there, by the members of that nation. So how does that national memory relate to the work of a historian? I think that um, certainly those who put together these you know, unifying narratives use the work of historians. Sometimes they pillage the work of historians just for what they need as building blocks for the story they want to tell. And I have, you know, that's no reason for historians not to practice history. The fact that someone may use their findings for purposes that weren't theirs initially. Um, and that's also not to say that there's no, no, no purposes served by that kind of enterprise, you know, putting together the narrative or the story. But there's a problem. Someone's going to come along eventually and ask, is it all true? And we saw that happen in Israel at one point in the 90s. People came along and said, well, we've got, you know, we've, it's what we were taught in school. Is it all true? And the danger there is that when one thing comes to unravel, people begin to doubt the whole edifice. So you can only cut so many corners in building a national narrative without endangering the solidarity of of the people behind a story. Some will see, some, and this is particularly true if there are aspects or elements in that story, which as soon as the first archive is open, come undone. So I think, you know, nat people who build nationalist history have to be very careful lest for, they, 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 they sacrifice in the long term the credibility of the enterprise by adopting stories which don't have a firm foundation. I'm not afraid of facts when they come to light. Um, in fact, I wish more of the material from 1948 was open. Some of the material was actually open and then closed. I don't think there's anything to hide about 1948. 
Um, and especially at the, this distance, now that we're marking 70 years, this should be a time when all, all the materials should be thrown open. I think we can, we can still present 1948 as uh, an inspirational story, even if here and there we will find things which, in retrospect, don't complement us from this or that point of view. And I certainly don't want to be involved in you know, creating a narrative which can be dismantled because five years or 10 years from now, somebody can open an archive and find something contradictory. So yes, I mean, it was, one could argue that there were, there were stages in the development of the history of, of, of Israel, earlier stages, when it was important to have unequivocal storyline. But um, we're 70. We're not, you know, that's, that's, that's already enough perspective and time, I think, for us to be able to look at the truth and tell it. And I happen to believe that although I don't want, I have no ambition to write inspirational history, that I leave for for others, and there I won't name names, but there are other examples of inspirational history. I think that even history as told straight straight up, there's plenty to inspire in it, um, because I think the, the story of Israel is a noble story, and warts and all, and uh, many of the warts actually only highlight ever more so our, um, our, our our unique characteristics as a people, and the way in which we deal and compensate for some of our failings is also, I think, uh, praiseworthy and inspirational. Martin, thank you very much. My pleasure.